future. Um, so the future of in-store technology and innovation, starting with some opening remarks and then opening up for a panel discussion. We have the one, the only, George Skywalker Shaw, head of R&D at Retail Next. George. So, contrary to the title of this talk, uh, I'm not going to talk about the future of in-store innovation and technology today. I'm going to talk about the future of the world. <laughs> um, it turns out that retail is part of the world, so I, I think it'll be fine, and we'll, we'll uh, be able to find some, some applicability from uh, the, what's happening in the rest of the world to, to what's happening in retail. But it's important to keep in mind while I go through this talk that you know, everything that we're talking about happening in retail stores in terms of technology, all the stuff that's going on, all the, the technology that we're building is actually also happening in the rest of the world. You know, the, way, the way that we're understanding, optimizing, managing our world is changing. It's an exciting time. Computing power is growing. Data collection is growing. You know, lots of stuff is happening. There are lots of trends that are going on. Um, all, again, very applicable to retail. So if I can figure out how to forward the slides. I just jumped two. That's OK. Um, so we're going to look at, at four sort of macro trends that are happening here. Um, and then again, we're going to focus a little bit on retail. But these are trends that are happening everywhere. There are probably going to be some buzzwords in here that you've heard before. So we'll go into some of those. We'll try to understand what, what some of these things mean and where, where some of this technology is going and uh, you know, where, where we think things are going to be in five years, maybe 10 years down the line. Um, digitizing the world, we'll start out looking at you know, how the world is becoming more digital. There's, there's more and more information being produced, more and more is understood digitally in computer readable and usable form about what's happening in the world. We're generating a ton of data, there's a lot of information out there, so you know, we, we are awash in data, and what does that actually mean to technology? What does that mean to, to how we're approaching analytics? Math to the rescue. Math is good, and it will help us to understand some of this, some of this stuff. So we'll get a little bit into, into some data science. I, I'll throw a couple equations up there, and there will be a test at the end, so pay very close attention. Um, and then access to the answers. You know, so we, we've done all this analysis, and we've, you know, we've got all this data, we've got all this information. We need to give access to that information to people. And how are we going to do that, and what does that look like? What's the roadmap for uh, providing access to that information? Everything is producing data. This is maybe a slight overstatement, but a lot of our, our a lot of our devices. There's a lot more technology there. It'll, you know, computers are everywhere, and and it's only getting more and more. And each of those devices produces data. You know, everything from cars to airplanes to my coffee pot, my refrigerator are all digital now. They all have little computers in them, little tiny chips everywhere that are all producing data. Some engineer in Stuttgart decided that. You know, this, this nerdy guy in California really wants to know exactly his tire pressures all the time. So added a couple of sensors to each wheel, spent probably an extra dollar on the car to add these sensors, connect them up to the, to the internal computer in the car so that we can look at our tire pressures. And you'll see I'm, I'm 0.2 PSI low in the front, which is kind of a problem. I'm going to fix that when I get back. Um, but the, 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 the point here is that there are sensors all over the automobile. There are sensors you know, all over all these kinds of vehicles. Um, and then also the car is powered by computers. You know, most automobiles now have computers that control at least the fuel injection, but typically most of the car, except for you know, Mark's vintage Mustang, probably doesn't have a computer, but you know, most, most other cars do. Um, and it's very easy to tap into those computers and, and get some information out of them and learn more about what's happening in the car. I thought this was an interesting fact. A Boeing jet generates 10 terabytes of information per half hour. So it's a 120 terabytes of data that gets generated on a trip to New York. Four engines, you've got half a petabyte of data that gets generated between here and New York. That's a lot of information. That's a ton of data. And that's just the engines. You know, that's just one piece. Everything in the jet is, is computer monitored, computer controlled. So you're generating amazing, amazing amounts of data. And then our homes. Our, our public spaces, you know, the, the, the areas where we live and shop 
are all also generating data. You know, again, like I said, the, there are computers everywhere from your refrigerator and your microwave and your oven and you know, all, the, all the appliances in your kitchen, all over your home, your home entertainment center, all these things are controlled by computers and those computers are generating data. There are certain things that don't have sensors attached to them, like people. So we use uh, other means to, to generate data about that. This is uh, people walking through a store. This is our video analytics. Most of you probably recognize that. Um, and video, video analytics is a really powerful way to, to generate more information as well, to understand what's happening in a space where you can't have sensors everywhere. Maybe? Ah, all right, we just skipped one. Are you able to back up for me? Great, thank you. Um, demographics, so again, video analytics, we can, we can automatically take a look at somebody's face and understand their approximate age, their gender, and also look at, at uh, mood, ethnicity, various other properties of, of somebody's face and understand more about them. This stuff happens automatically, extremely quickly, extremely efficiently. This is stuff that we're doing today. You know, this, is, this is technology that's out in the world right now. Here we go. Um, so facial recognition is the, the next step beyond demographics. It's actually, the, the technology is very similar. If you look at the, the, the mathematics behind it, it's very similar. This is an artist's rendition of facial recognition because we're not actually looking at things like the point of the nose. This is actually a more realistic rendition of how, how this stuff actually gets done. These are actually SIFT features, which are, which are mathematical features that get pulled out of the pixels of the image. So the computer goes, looks at the pixels, figures out where these relevant features are, and can compare those features to features of, of Julian's dancing penguin, for example, and, and discover that that's, that's actually a penguin. So this happens automatically. The computer can go watch video and say, that's a penguin. That's, that's pretty impressive. Um, but it can also go and say, this is the same face that I've seen before. So if you can do that when somebody walks into a store, do that again when they walk back out, you know how long they were in the store, for example, just as, as one easy use case to think about. Um, the computer can't go in and find out all of your bank information and all that stuff, so when we say facial recognition, you know, sometimes that's a, that's a topic that comes up. We start to think about privacy, but it's really just able to say, you know, this face is the same as this face. This is a technology that's, that's been changing a lot lately. There's been some new approaches. Um, Facebook just, uh, just, came up with, just came out with a paper that says they can, they can beat any person's ability to match a face with this new algorithm called Deep Face, um, where you can take any photo, take any other photo of the same person, different poses, different lighting, different hairstyles, different everything, and the algorithm will match those and say this is the same person. There's obvious applications for Facebook, but just the fact that this technology is coming out into the world uh, is pretty exciting stuff. Logo recognition actually is another application. It's another, another thing that we use this same kind of approach to do. Um, I think we've shown logo recognition at, at this event in the past where you can automatically go and say, hey, that's a, that's a Macy's logo there. And you know, understand what kind of bags people are bringing into the store, for example, or what they're wearing. Ah. I can work a computer pretty well, but I'm completely incapable of working this clicker, apparently. <laughs> Apologies for that. <laughs> so we, you know, we, we think about something like DeepFace or you know, these, other, these other really sophisticated algorithms, these things that are, that, are, that are coming online, and one of the questions people ask is, you know, oh my god, what kind of computer do I need to be able to run that? Well, you know, sometimes you do need the Tianhe supercomputer that does you know, 38, I think, petaflops. It's an, unbelievably fast supercomputer. It's really useful to, to look at computing environments like this and see what you can do, what's possible. If I, if I throw the horsepower of this thing at a problem, can I solve that problem? You know, it starts to, starts to go to, into computer science where we talk about the theory of computation and what possibly can be computed. Well, this is what can be computed in semi-practical terms. But one of the really nice things is that engineers tend to be really, really good at making stuff smaller. Right? So you take what this thing can do, and you turn it into what this thing can do. The same functionality translates to a rack mount server that you can easily put in a data center or in a store, and then eventually it goes to what this thing can do. You get a dedicated small device that can do the same kinds of things. So you know, technology 
and, and hardware is shrinking, it's getting smaller, it's getting more and more powerful, so we're able to do more in less space. So again, it's really useful to look at what we can do with a supercomputer so that we can see what we can do in, in, a, very, in a very small sort of compact environment. You get a device like this that can, that can do all this stuff on its own. You put that out into the world and you start to be able to do things like give my girlfriend Katrina a parking ticket automatically in <laughs> South London where <laughs> the, the English government had no involvement in this ticket at all. A device sitting on, on top of a, a light post saw the car parked illegally, had some analytics that were running on it that said that car is, is parked illegally. Let me fire off a ticket to whoever's the owner of that car. It can t see the license plate. It can see that it's parked illegally. This, this device does one thing and it does it really well. It's not dissimilar from trying to understand how many customers are parked near a particular fixture in a retail store. So this visualization is just showing you know, the number of people that stopped in any particular location. The device is, is watching the video, generating this tracking information, and understanding how many customers stopped at any one spot. Another way that we can, we can look at location and we can try to understand where people are, apart from seeing them with video, is to look at the devices that they are carrying around. So, you know, I said people don't have sensors. That's actually not true. Most of you have a smartphone in your pocket. That smartphone is giving off wireless signals. With various technologies, um, we're able to track those wireless signals and understand where you are. And some of you have seen, and if you haven't, you should see in the solution showcase, um, we've got a demo of tracking the apps that, that many of you have downloaded. If you haven't downloaded the app, please do so. Um, and we're able to, to look at, based, using the app and using a set of beacons, we're able to see where you were and how long you spent there. So the beacon is just a, a, a small, dumb device. Most of you have heard of iBeacons, but just a quick refresher, it just pings. All it does is pings. It says, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I'm number 12, and I'm here. I'm number 12, and I'm here. Your phone sees that ping and says, oh, I'm, I'm right near number 12, sends that information up to the cloud where analytics can happen. That's data that just got generated that says this person carrying this phone was near beacon number 12. And this is changing. You know, your, your phone may turn into a watch. It may turn into something else. You know, wearables are a big thing um, that, are, that are, are sort of coming, coming online where a lot of people are wearing more and more technology. The point here is that they're all generating wireless signals. We can look at those wireless signals and understand more and more about what's happening. <coughs> RFIDs, the last uh, data generation thing that I'll, that I'll touch on. RFID is already in use a lot. It's getting used more and more in retail. I think we're about to see you know, a huge tidal wave of, of RFID adoption. Um, you'll be able to track a piece of inventory from manufacturing. You know, here we see all the way through the supply chain. But then as you get into a store as well, you'll be able to understand where each of those pieces of inventory are in real time in a store. This is something that we're we're working with a partner on to actually bring into our system and to, to develop technology around RFID-based RFID inventory tracking. So we're actually digitizing the world. We're creating a digital representation of everything that you see around you. It was, it's funny, I showed, um, showed the matrix to my kids a couple weeks ago, and what was really interesting wasn't that their minds were blown by it. When I first saw the matrix, like many of you, my mind was blown. I couldn't believe it, and you know, I just I, I laid awake at night thinking about, oh my God, what if we're living in the Matrix? My kids, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a kind of nerdy guy, but um, <laughs> what was interesting showing it to my kids was their minds weren't blown, because the world that they were born into was a lot closer to the Matrix than the world that that we were all born into. You know, there's there's more and more digital information. They live half their lives inside some digital universe, whether it's a video game or, or you know these social games or social media, you know. My son is on Instagram more often than he's you know, actually in the living room with me. So you know, this, this, this is happening. It's, it's you know, an interesting fantasy to think about the matrix, but it, you know, it's, we're actually getting closer and closer to it. Really interesting things start to happen, though, when you connect all this data. So we generated a whole bunch of data. Just like the personal computer revolution in the 80s was you know, a revolution, we call it a revolution, but it didn't get really interesting until we got the internet. Until we took all these computers and we connected them together, stuff started really happening. So we're generating all this data, and it's just sitting there. Once it all starts to become connected, that's when things are going to be really exciting. 
and we start to talk about the Internet of Things. It's one of those buzzwords that, that you probably have heard. It's a buzzword for a reason. It's, it's happening. It's exciting. There's a lot of new technology that's going to be coming online because of this. You know, we're around in here somewhere. 18.2 billion devices are probably connected to this Internet of Things, but you'll see it's growing quite quickly. And at some point, looks like about 2020 or so, just about every digital device will be connected to this. You know, we're building protocols, we're building ways to connect these things, ways to make sense of all that data so that they can connect reliably. Um, I was just looking at a, at a company called Parse um, that has, a, has a, basically a set of SDKs that let you connect anything up to the cloud, and then they normalize the data and figure out how to give you access to it. There's a lot of that kind of stuff happening. You know, there are a lot of the big companies, IBM and some of these guys, that are working real hard on the Internet of Things, too. You look at the data sources that Retail Next supports today, and there are actually a couple of others that aren't on here. We're, we're working towards being a platform for the in-store Internet of Things. By bringing all these different data types into our system, um, we're, we're actually working on being that protocol, being that platform, being the way that all these things actually get connected. So tons of data, tons and tons of data is all coming together. What do we do with it? We have to, we have to figure out how to deal with all this data. This was IBM's estimate in about 2013, where about the amount of data that's being produced every year, the scale over there on the side is in exabytes. Exabytes are really big. <laughs> that's a lot of data. We didn't grow quite as fast as, as IBM thought we would. A, a lot of estimates put us you know, somewhere in the, the half exabyte, or uh, half, half uh, uh, what's after exabyte? Zeta? I think it's Zeta. Looking at the engineers over here for a, for a pointer, we're, we're at about the half, half zettabyte level right now, um, but, it's, but it's growing every year. You know, we're getting more and more, more and more information. I thought this was another really interesting fact, that we've produced more data, more information has been produced in the last two years than in the entire history of humanity combined. I mean, think about that for a second. Every book that's ever been written, everything that's ever been produced from the beginning of time until about 2013 isn't as much information as was produced from 2013 until now. We're making a lot of data. We have to figure out ways to make sense of the data and ways to, to make use of it. So sensor fusion, this is one of the things that's going to be on that test. <laughs> Everybody got it? What, what sensor fusion really means is just bringing together information from a bunch of different sensors. You know, very, very, very simply, you take information from this video analytic, you take information from that video analytic, information from wireless, information from all these different things that I talked about that are producing data, and you bring them together so that instead of having a whole bunch of different data points about something that's happening, you have one data point or a couple of data points about this thing that's happening in the world. What does that actually look like? This is sensor fusion that was done in uh, one of Julian's stores in London. This is the, uh, the kids' store where we had 14 video cameras. So the simplest kind of sensor fusion that we did here was to track people across all 14 of those cameras. So that was sensor fusion where we fused 14 different sensors, video analytics across all 14 of this, these cameras. Because what you really care about is not what that camera can see. You really care about where this person was in the store. So we generate a coordinate for every moment that we see this person. And we end up with something like that. When we layer in wireless, so we have these, these tags. I think uh, it was Jeff that was talking about these tags. Somebody was just talking about the, the employee exclusion tags. Um, these are, these in, in this store were Wi-Fi tags. We're now using Bluetooth-based tags. But that's another sensor. That's another piece of data that we can layer in and tag each of those paths through the entire store as either an associate or a customer. So we've now done sensor fusion again. We've created even more metadata, even more information that, that gets at what we really care about so that we can actually throw away the pixels, not save the, the video and all, the, all this real heavy data, and, and save some more lightweight information. This is, this is gender. So we looked at demographics as well. And we can layer that in, tag every single track with gender. So now we've got each track through the store tagged as either an associate or a customer, as either a male or a female. And finally, as either a purchaser or a non-purchaser, when we layer in the sensor of the point of sale terminal. So that's another piece of data that we can layer in to, to better understand what's happening in there. 
when we have all this metadata, we have all this information, what it really does is gives us an efficient way to access the things that we care about. So this is one customer. You would never know how to go find this one path that you cared about if you didn't have enough metadata to really go in and look at that one path and, and say, well, I want to find out you know, what one person did at 1202 who was a male who purchased who was not an employee or whatever the question is that you want to answer. This gives you a way to do that. You get a unique identifier so you can have efficient access from a database and tag all these other, all, all these other pieces of data that are associated with the path. Bringing together all these, all these sensor types as well can let you do things like interaction analysis. Understand when associates and customers are interacting, when they're talking to each other. It becomes very, very simple once you've got all that metadata attached. You're really just saying, show me when this one was near this one. It's, it's as easy as that. It's basically a database query to let you do something like interaction analysis if you've got all that metadata and all that information underlying that database query. Of course, we don't want to do interaction analysis for one interaction. We, we like to look at, at scale here. So we're trying to do this at scale. I, I slowed this down a little bit so that you could, you could really see what was going on. That's a single day. Of course, we do this all the time. So we're looking at, at you know, thousands of stores across you know, every single day to produce this kind of information, to, to learn at scale how these interactions are happening. And this is just one example of the, the kind of stuff that we're doing now. So we've taken all these connected things and we've added a giant hard drive. That's basically what it is. You, know, you, have, you have these huge databases with, with you know, really great, interesting new technologies. There's lots of, lots of new database kind of technology coming online more efficient hardware, all kinds of stuff happening in that space, you end up with, with rooms like this. This is like nerd mecca. <laughs> this is a giant room full of very powerful computers, and there are lots and lots of rooms just like this. You know, when we, when we start to talk about the cloud, that's what the cloud is. Really, the cloud is not some you know, mythical place where the, the grand nerd sits up there <laughs> doing math. You know, the, the, the cloud is really a bunch of big rooms full of really powerful computers that are all connected by really, really fat pipes. That's all the cloud is. And those, those powerful computers give access to this mountain of data, this, this data that we're awash in. So we've got all this data. We've got efficient access to it. We've got, you know, a cloud full of, full of all kinds of information getting up to, to yada bytes, is what comes after zettas, I think, of, of information in the world. So what? It, it really doesn't help you that much if you just have all this data. You really need to be able to make sense of it. You want to learn things from the data because you, know, you, you want to go and manage retail stores, for example, or whatever it is that you're trying to do. You need, you need answers. So we're going to go through a little bit of data science here and, and touch on a couple, of, a couple of relevant pieces of data science. First, we're going to hear from Peter Norvig, who's the head of research for Google. And that's where I Google. think that the data comes to the rescue that if we want to understand uh, sociology, how people act, uh, we can't reduce that to a simple equation. But if we have a lot of data about what they do, then we can start to understand how it works. And that's where the effectiveness is. So Google is very, very good at this stuff. They, they, they process data quite well. They have a lot of incredibly smart data scientists there. But what Google has done better than anybody else, and I, I, I learned this from a, a talk that I heard that um, Peter Norvig actually gave, what they've done really well is deal with the scale. So they can hold most of the internet in memory at any one time. To, to you non-computer science-y people, that doesn't mean quite as much as to maybe these guys sitting over here to, to think about what that means to be able to hold the entire internet in memory. They've come up with engineering approaches and ways to actually do that and, and work at that kind of scale. But once they've done that, they've got to do something with all that data. So they do things like this. This is probably the, the very first thing that a data scientist does. It's called principal component analysis. Um, this also will be on the test, so please pay close attention. Um, but what principal component analysis does basically is takes a huge data set, a, a, a giant data set, and figures out what's the point. And takes the, that point, boils it down to its essence, and creates a much, much, much smaller data set. Basically says, you know, here's the answer. You know, here, here's what this huge data set, this vast mountain of data, here's what it actually means. It does that by reducing the dimensionality. So 
Ray is constantly making fun of me because I talk about dimensionality reduction, but I thought I'd, I thought I'd give it another go and, and see, if, see if I can talk about dimensionality reduction in a way that's not going to cause everybody's eyes to glaze over. So you've got a cube. It's in three dimensions. It's a, it's a physical object. This is a cube on a screen, so it's two dimensions, but imagine that this is <laughs> actually a cube. <laughs> and what you really want to know is you, you want to find out the, the point. What, what, what's the point? I have, I have this three-dimensional structure, and I really want to know what the point is. I'm going to just flatten the cube out and figure out which of these faces really matters the most. This is a gross oversimplification, of course, um, but it really is what something like dimensionality reduction does. And you think about that in the context of the, these mountains of, of retail data, for example, and you take all this information that you have, all this customer movement, I think we've done some demos of some of this kind of stuff in the past, and you boil it down. You take away all the stuff that matters the least, and you're left with just the things that matter the most. You're able to say, you know, this is the most common path, for example. This is, these are the people that, that actually purchase. This group of people purchases. And then you can go and you can study things about that group of people. Something like dimensionality reduction actually does that. There are kinetic maps. Again, this is the, the Ralph Lauren store um, where we've got a kinetic map. What this kinetic map actually is, though, I mean, it's a, it's a nice looking picture, but it's really a visualization of a two dimensional data structure. It's a, a spatial histogram, which you can form as a multinomial. So once you've done that, <laughs> great things happen. <laughs> um, the, 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 the point here, though, is, is that we can take this retail data, we can take information from what we see in, in a store or wherever. You know, again, this is not just happening in stores, but we can take all that information. We can form it in ways that mathematicians understand. And when we've done that, we can start to apply existing mathematics. We don't have to invent new stuff. We've taken retail data, and we've given it to the mathematicians in their language. So we can start to generate statistics like this. You, this will also be on the test. This is um, KL divergence up at the top, which is a statistic that already exists. We didn't have to invent it. All we had to do was say, let's take this movement data from inside a store, treat it as a probability distribution over the space of the store. Then we can take that probability distribution, compare it to another one. And so what that really says is, how different is the movement pattern today as compared to last week? or whatever those two time periods are. Is today an unusual day, or is today a very normal day? And that one number that just falls out of the analysis. This is entropy, Shannon entropy. Claude Shannon at Bell Labs in the I think, or, uh, late 1940s came up with this as a way to, to measure how much information you needed to send over a wire in order to build the first phone system that would, would speak to Europe from Bell Labs in New York. Um, but what this, what the way we use it here is to understand the randomness of behavior in a store. You know, how, how random are people as they move around a store? Is it very predictable? Does everybody follow the exact same path? Or are people just wandering randomly? You know, is, the, is there predictability in that data, in that probability of where people are going to be? The final one is Ripley's K, which is used by epidemiologists to understand disease outbreak. Um, we can get these kinds of approaches, these, these bits of mathematics that are useful to us, we can find them everywhere. So you go in and look through the epidemiology academic journals, and that, I do that in my spare time. <laughs> um, but if you, if you were to go do that, you would, you would find approaches like this that are applicable to stores. You know, they're looking at disease outbreaks. We might want to see you know, how clustered people's shopping behavior is. Do they shop here, and then here, and then here, or are they moving fluidly? through a space. So it's, again, a single number falls out of an analysis like this that becomes really meaningful to us. Finally, a, a, an approach that we did create. So this is looking at a, a probabilistic model of people's movement patterns. What are the transition probabilities from any one area to any other area? We're watching that model build up over time. You see it renormalizes with each new customer. Um, and what you see down here is just excuse me, part of the transition matrix. From this point to that point, what's the probability? How many people did we see go from there to there? How many people did we see go from there over to there? And that lets us understand movement patterns in a, in a very numerical way, in a probabilistic way. And it also lets us frame that problem in ways, again, that mathematicians can understand so that we can apply other, other kinds of approaches. I could sit here and watch this stuff, but. I should probably move on. <laughs> so we've generated a ton of data. We've digitized the world. We've got information about everything that's happening. 
We figured out ways to access that data efficiently, quickly, scalably. We've found some math that's relevant to give us some answers to that data. Now we have to deliver those answers. We have to give those answers to the, to the people that care about them. So how do we do that? Well, we employ data visualization experts, for example. This is a, a new field, relatively new. You know, maybe the last 10 years or so, it didn't, it didn't exist before. And I talked to former graphic design colleagues of mine, and some of them hate this, because they're not numbers people, but there were some that were, were sort of closet mathematicians, and they love it, you know, because they're, they're applying creativity and art and aesthetics to data. They're using Excel more than they ever did before. They're using um, tools like processing, which is sort of a, I guess it's kind of a Java library at the end of the day, but it's a way to give graphic designers the ability to process this huge amount of information so that they can bring the things that they know about typography and scale and, and you know, information content and you know, the ways to deliver information effectively, they can give that to the people who need it in ways that make sense to them. Just a quick search on Google to, to see what the current state of UI design is. The current state is great. This is a, a, a fertile ecosystem. There's lots and lots of work being done. Having come from, from that industry, I can definitely tell you that you know, the people doing this stuff really care about innovation, and they really want to make the interfaces that they design and the user experiences that they design better and better and better. HCI, human computer interaction, is being studied at every university around the world. People are working really hard on these problems, and we're leveraging that work. We're, we're using the stuff that they're figuring out about how to deliver information in order to deliver our customers, retailers, that information. There are going to be new mediums for delivering information. You know, I talked a little bit about wearables. You know, the Apple Watch here is, is you know, the, the latest gizmo on the market, but there's going to be 1,000 gizmos after that. There are going to be lots and lots of different ways that we get our information, and we're going to have to work towards delivering information effectively in all these different, all these different mediums. And finally, I'll end on this. Um, this is, this is you know, a, a Hollywood fantasy of what interfaces might look like sometime in the future, when it's really useful to look at fantasies like this and, and what really creative people down in Los Angeles think an interface should be like and how we're going to get that, that data and how we're going to get that information and those answers and those insights, the product of all that sensing and processing and mathematics, the product of that we need to get. And it's going to get more and more complicated as there's more and more stuff. But people are probably not going to get more and more smart. So we've got to be better about delivering that information in ways that people can actually make use of. So just to review, you know, we've, we've sensed the entire world. We've, we've got sensors everywhere that are generating huge amounts of data. We figured out ways to process that data, ways to, ways to give efficient access to it, ways to make sense of it. We've applied some mathematics to that. This is, you know, data, data science is, is easily one of the most important topics here. It's one of the fastest growing pieces of this whole puzzle. Um, and then we've given people access to those answers. And then finally, you'll, you'll notice that this does correspond to the layers in our technology stack that we like to talk about for, for any analytics platform. You have to sense, you process, you analyze, and then you present those answers. Mm -hmm.